Hello everybody, I am Pet Officer Lai and I'm here to help you become FMF qualified. This is a series of audio recordings containing ditties, acronyms, tips and tricks to help remember the information in the book. This is by no means all the information you need to know, but should provide a good baseline of knowledge for your FMF qualification. Just be aware that everything and anything in the book is questionable during your boards. With that being said, let's begin. Today's session that we'll be discussing is 102, Marine Corps History, Rank Structure, and Courtesy Fundamentals. History for most people is the hardest part simply because of the dates, names, and battles that need to be memorized. There aren't too many ditties or acronyms that can help you with this section, and it's mostly a matter of memorization. So for this section, I'm going to read it off, and hopefully hearing a voice will help you retain the information. Marine Corps history begins on November 10th, 1775. Important things to remember include two battalions of Marines being raised in Tunn's Tavern in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They are raised by Captain Samuel Nichols, who is thought to be the first Commandant of the Marine Corps. The first Marine landing took place during the Revolutionary War in 1776. Marines invaded New Providence Island in the Bahamas to seize guns and supplies. The term leatherneck was coined here because the uniform of the day was a stiff leather stock worn around the neck. In 1805, Marines stormed the Barbary Pirate stronghold of Burma on the shores of Tripoli. This was the first time the Stars and Stripes were raised in the Eastern Hemisphere. In 1847, during the Mexican War, Marines occupied the Halls of Montezuma during the Battle of Chapultepec in Mexico City. Marines invaded the Royal Palace and were amongst the first to enter the capital. Marines also helped to take California. In 1859, under command of Robert, Colonel Robert E. Lee, Marines stormed the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry and put down an attempted slave revolt led by abolitionist John Brown. In 1868, the Marine Corps adopted the Eagle Globe and Anchor as their emblem. The 7th Commandant, Brigadier General Jacob Zalem, modified the Royal Marines emblem to depict the Marines as American and maritime. The eagle represents the nation, and the globe and anchor represent the worldwide service and sea traditions. In 1883, the Marine Corps adopted the motto Semper Fidelis, or Latin for Always Faithful. In 1900, in support of foreign policy, Marines went to China and defended the American legation in Peking, China during the Boxer Rebellion. They were part of a multinational defense that protected the legation against attack. They held it against the rebels until a relief force came and put the rebellion down. In 1913, the Marine Aviation Unit was established. Major Alfred A. Cunningham was the first pilot. In 1917, Marines participated in eight distinct operations, distinguishing themselves and were awarded several decorations, including the French Fragere, which is still worn by the 5th and 6th Marines. In 1933, the Marine Corps was reorganized into Fleet Marine Force. This formally established the command and administrative relations between the Fleet and the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps Equipment Board was established in Quantico, Virginia. Long hours were devoted to testing and developing materials for landing operations and expeditionary services. In 1965, the Marine Corps was committed to the longest war in its history. They landed in South Vietnam and conducted large-scale offensive operations. They participated in pacification programs designed to help win support of the local populace. Marines also landed in the Dominican Republic to evacuate and protect U.S. citizens. Marines formed a multinational defense that restored peace. In 1982, the Marine Corps was de deployed to Lebanon as part of a multinational peacekeeping force that helped to restore peace and order to the war-torn country. This action displayed the Marines as a force in readiness. On October 23, 1983, a suicide truck bombed the headquarters killing 241 Americans and injuring 70 others. The last Marine units withdrew in July of 1984. In 1991, Operation Desert Storm was launched. The operation was launched in response to the Iraqis' government refusal to comply with UN resolutions. Marine aviation was utilized in January of 1991. When massive bombings failed to dislodge Iraqi forces, Marine ground forces swept into Kuwait and liberated the country. Iraqi military capability was greatly impaired. In 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom was launched. This is the official name for the war in Afghanistan, which falls under the global war on terrorism. On October 7, 2001, early operations included a mix of airstrikes from aircraft and Tomahawk missiles launched from U.S. and British ships. 2003 was the invasion of Iraq. The invasion was led by the U.S. alongside the United Kingdom and smaller contingents from Australia and Poland. The initial invasion phase lasted from March 20th to May 1, 2003. In 2004 was the first Battle of Fallujah, codenamed Vigilant Resolve. This was an unsuccessful attempt by the U.S. to capture the city of Fallujah in April 2004. Later in 2004 was the Second Battle of Fallujah, codenamed Operation al fajr or the Dawn in Arabic, and Operation Phantom Fury. This was a joint U.S.-Iraqi-British offensive in November and December of 2004. Led by the U.S. against Iraqi insurgency in the city of Fallujah, this attack was authorized by the U.S.-appointed Iraqi interim government. Next, we will be discussing seven important battles in Marine Corps history. The first battle is the Battle of Belle Wood. Marines fought one of their greatest battles in its history at Belle Wood, France, during World War I. 
Marines helped to crush a German offensive at Belleau Wood that threatened Paris. In honor of the Marines who fought there, the French renamed the area the Wood of the Brigade of the Marines. German intelligence evaluated the Marines as stormtroops, the highest rating on the enemy fighting scale. In reference to the Marines' ferocious fighting ability, the German troops called their new enemy Tuffelhunden, or Devil Dogs, a nickname in which Marines share pride. Next we have the Battle of Guadalcanal. On August 7, 1942, the 1st Marine Division landed in the beaches of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands and launched the first United States land offensive of World War II. This battle marked the first combat test of the new amphibious doctrine and also provided a crucial turning point of the war in the Pacific by providing a base to launch further invasions of Japanese-held islands. Amphibious landings followed on the remaining Solomon Islands, including New Georgia, Chosol, and Bougainville. Next, we have the Battle of Tarawa. The Gilbert Islands were the first in the line of advance for the offensive in the Central Pacific. The prime objective was the Tarawa Atoll and Betiwa Island, which had been fortified to the point that the Japanese commander proclaimed that it would take a million Americans 100 years to conquer it. On November 20, 1943, Marines landed and secured the island within 76 hours, but paid a heavy price in doing so. Because of an extended reef, landing craft could not cross it, and Marines were offloaded hundreds of yards from the beaches. This led to heavy losses from any enemy fire, and additionally, many Marines drowned while attempting to wade ashore. Next, we have the Battle of the Mariana Islands. Due to the need for airfields by the Air Force and advanced bases for the Navy, the Marianas were invaded. Landings on the islands of Saipan, Guan, and Tinian accomplished this. During June and July of 1943, Lieutenant General Holland M. Smith led a combined invasion force of Marines and soldiers that totaled over 136,000. This was the greatest number of troops up to that point to operate in the field under Marine command. Next, we have the Battle of Iwo Jima. On February 19, 1945, Marines landed on Iwo Jima in what was the largest all-Marine battle in history. It was also the bloodiest for the Marine Corps. The Marines Corps suffered over 22,300 casualties. The capture of Iwo Jima greatly increased the air support and bombing operations against the Japanese home islands. Of the savage battle, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz said, among the Americans who served on Iwo Island, uncommon valor was a common virtue. Next, we have the Battle of Chosen Reservoir. After pushing far into North Korea during November of 1950, Marines were cut off after the Chinese Communist forces entered the war. Despite facing a 10-division enemy force sent to annihilate them, Marines smashed seven of these enemy divisions in their march from the Chosen Reservoir. The major significance of this retrograde movement was that the Marines bought all their operable equipment and properly evacuated the wounded and dead and maintained tactical integrity. And finally, we have the Battle of Hua City. During the Vietnamese holiday of Tet in January of 1968, communist forces launched a surprise offensive by infiltrating large numbers of their troops into major population centers of Hua City, South Vietnam. A near division sized unit of NVA troops occupied the city of Hue and the Citadel. Marines fought in built-up areas for the first time since the Korean War, foregoing application of heavy arms to minimize civilian casualties. Fighting was house-to-house -house with progress measured in yards. The city was secured on February 25th, 1968. And now we will be discussing noteworthy Marines and sailors in Marine Corps history. First, we have Archibald Henderson. Brevet Brigadier General Archibald Henderson became Commandant in 1920 and held his command for 39 years until his death in 1859. General Henderson led the course of the Indian Wars, the War with Mexico, the opening of China, and the disorders in Central America. The grand old man of the Marine Corps, as he is often called, introduced higher standards of personal appearance, training, discipline, and strived to have the Marine Corps known as a professional military force, capable of more than just sea and guard duties. Next, we have John Quick. Sergeant Major John Quick was remembered for his performance at Cusco Wall in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, who participated in operation to seize an advanced base for the Atlantic Fleet Battalion of Marines. The Sergeant Major won the Medal of Honor for semaphoring for an emergency lift of the Naval Bombardment while under Spanish and American shellfire. The landing at Guantanamo demonstrated the usefulness of Marines as assault troops. When employed with the fleet, Marines gave added strength to the capture and defense of advanced bases, becoming a primary mission in the Marine Corps. Next we have Dan Daly. Sergeant Major Dan Daly is recognized for earning two Medal of Honors. The first was for the Chinese Boxer Rebellion and the second was for the first kick of war in Haiti. When his unit was pinned down and their attack was stalled during the Battle of Bella Wood, the then Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly yelled to his men, Come on, you sons of bitches, do you want to live forever? Next, we have Louis B. Chessy Pooler. Lieutenant General Pooler served in Nicaragua through several periods of political unrest and rebellious activity. Pooler and a force of about 32 Marines became famous for their ability to engage rebel groups and bandits while scouring the jungles in a wide area of Nicaragua in the Honduran border. Pooler became known as the Tiger of the Mountains. 
The Marine Corps mascot, an English bulldog named Chessy, is named for this brave and fine Marine Corps officer. And now we have Gregory R. Pappy Boynton. Major Boynton is recognized for his prowess in aerial dogfights. Pappy commanded VMH 214, the Black Sheep, during World War II. By the end of the war, the Major was recognized as the Marine Corps' top ranking flying ace with 28 victories. And now we have Ira H. Hayes. The 5th Amphibious Corps of Marines, commanded by Major General Harry Schmidt, was assigned to take Iwo Jima. Corporal Ira Hayes, a Pima Indian, was one of the Marines immortalized in the now famous photograph taken of the second flag raising incident on Mount Suribachi shortly after the Japanese stronghold was taken on February 23, 1945. And now we have Ofa Johnson. Private Johnson became the Marine Corps' first enlisted woman on August 13, 1918. Her enlistment was a reflection of the dramatic changes in the status of women brought about by the entry of the United States into World War I. Marine Reserve F was the official title by which the Marine Corps first enlisted women were known. They were better known as Skirt Marines and Marinettes. And now we have Margaret A. Brewer. Brigadier General Brewer, then a colonel, served as the Director of Women's Marines during the period of 1973 through 1977. She was the seventh and last Director of Women's Marines the only post-World War woman to hold the position. Margaret Brewer became the Marine Corps' first woman general officer on May 11, 1978. And next we have Robert E. Bush. On May 2, 1945, during the Battle of Fort Okinawa, Hospital Apprentice First Class Robert E. Bush was a rifle company corpsman with the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, 5th Marine Division. While attacking the enemy, a Marine officer fell wounded in a fire swept location. Bush, who had been assisting other wounded Marines, went to the officer's exposed position and administered blood plasma amidst the perilous battle conditions. As the Japanese counterattacked, he courageously remained with the disabled officer, firing back with one hand while holding the plasma bottle in the other. Despite his own serious injuries, Bush continued to provide aid until his patient was evacuated. For his conspicuous gallantry on this occasion, he was presented with the Medal of Honor by President Harry S. Truman on October 5, 1945, during Nimitz Day. He was the youngest World War II Navy man to receive a Medal of Honor. And next we have pharmacist mate second class John H. Bradley, the second figure from the right on the near side of the iconic Joe Rosenthal photo, joined with five Marines to raise old glory atop Mount Suribachi on February 23, 1945. On February 21st, seeing a wounded Marine, Bradley rushed to his aid through a mortar barrage and heavy machine gun fire. Although other men from his unit were willing to help him with the casualty, Bradley motioned them to stay back. Shielding the Marine with his own body, the hospital corpsman administered a unit of plasma and bandaged his wounds. Through the gunfire, he then pulled a casualty 30 yards to safety. For these actions, pharmacy mate second class John H. Bradley was awarded the Navy Cross. And lastly, we have Robert R. Ingram. On March 28, 1966, in the Quang Nai province of Republic of Vietnam, Petty Officer Ingram accompanied the Point Platoon as it aggressively engaged in an outpost of an NVA battalion. As the battle moved off a ridgeline down a tree-covered slope to a small rice paddy and a village below, a tree line suddenly exploded with an intense hail of automatic rifle fire from approximately 100 North Vietnamese regulars. In moments, the platoon was decimated. Oblivious to the danger, Petty Officer Ingram craw crawled across the battlefield to reach a down Marine. As he administered aid, a bullet went through the palm of his hand. Cost requirement echoed across the ridge. Bleeding, he edged across the fire-swept landscape, collecting ammunition for the dead and administering aid to the wounded. Receiving two more wounds, with the third wound being a life-threatening one, he looked for a way off the face of the ridge, but again he heard the call for help and again he resolutely answered. He gathered magazines, resupplied, and encouraged those capable of returning fire and rendered aid to the more severely wounded until he finally reached the right flank of the platoon. While dressing the head wound of another corpsman, he sustained his fourth bullet wound. From 1600 until almost sunset, Petty Officer Ingram pushed, pulled, cajoled, and doctored his marines. And during the pain from, pain from his many wounds and disregarding the probability of his own death, Petty Officer Ingram's gallant actions saved many lives that day. And for that, he received the Medal of Honor. Next, we were discussing when and when not to salute. When and how to salute. Begin your salute in ample time, at least 6 but not more than 30 paces away. Hold your salute until it is returned or acknowledged. Accompany the salute with an appropriate greeting. Look squarely at the person or colors being saluted, and then render the salute only once if a senior remains in the immediate vicinity. Render the salute again if conversation takes place when a senior leaves or when you depart. For saluting in a group, if your group is not in formation, then the first person to notice an officer approaching calls the group to attention and salutes for the group, or the entire group salutes the officer. If your group is in formation, then the senior person calls the formation to attention and salutes for the group. If you are passing an officer that is going the same direction as you, come abreast to the officer, salute and say, by your leave, sir or ma'am. The officer returns the salute and says, carry on or granted. Terminate your salute and pass ahead. Be sure to salute all officers, regular and reserve, and of all branches. 
as well as foreign militaries and naval officers whose governments are formally recognized by the U.S. government. Do not salute when working indoors. Do not salute a prisoner or guarding prisoners. Under battle conditions, in ranks, at games, or part of a working detail, at crowded gatherings, in public conveyances, or in congested areas unless you are addressing or are being directly addressed by a senior. Doing so would physically interfere with your performance or assigned duty or would create a hazard while your blouse or coat is unbuttoned or with a smoking device in your hand. Next, we were discussing rank. By now, we have all been in the military long enough to know the ranks for all the officers, so I'm not even going to go over that. We've also all been through Field Medical Training Battalion, so we should know all the Marine ranks as well. However, just to refresh her, E8 has two different ranks, being First Sergeant and Master Sergeant. And then E9 has three different ranks, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major, and Master Gunnery Sergeant. Next, we'll be discussing the procedures for rendering honors and the circumstances during which honors are rendered during colors, the National Anthem, and boarding naval vessels. If you are neither in formation nor in vehicle, then render the prescribed salute and hold the salute until the last note of the music is sounded. If no flag is near, then face the music and salute. If you are in a formation, then salute only on the command. Present arms. If you are outdoors and uncovered, then stand at attention, face the direction of the flag or music. If you are indoors, then stand at attention, face the music and or flag. If you are in a vehicle, then the driver should halt the vehicle, passengers and driver remain seated at attention and do not salute. If you are passing or being passed by an uncased color which is being paraded, presented or is on a formal display, then salute at six paces distance and hold the salute for six paces beyond or until it has passed your position by six paces. If you are uncovered, then stand or march at attention when passing or being passed by an uncased color. For rendering honors while boarding and departing ships. When boarding a naval ship between 0800 sunset, face aft upon reaching the top of the gangway, salute the national ensign, salute the officer of the deck who will be standing on the quarterdeck at the head of the gangway, and request permission to come aboard. When departing a naval ship between 0800 to sunset, salute the OD and request permission to go ashore. Go to the brow, turn aft, and salute the national ensign. When boarding and departing a naval ship between sunset and 0800, follow the above procedures but do not turn aft and do not salute the national ensign.